Okay, so now I am joined by LinkedIn ads expert, AJ Wilcox. AJ, welcome to the show. Bailey, so excited to be here. Thanks for the invite. You got it. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to interview you as well on this. I know you are really uh, deep into the weeds on the LinkedIn ads platform, and that's definitely something I wanted to learn more about. So I'm very glad to have you on the podcast. But before we run into all that, why don't you give the people a quick introduction on who you are, what you do, and how you've gained experience during your, during your career running LinkedIn ads? Sounds great. Well, I've been doing digital marketing for almost 15 years now, and I started out in search engine optimization and in Google ads. And then this has been 11 years ago, but I went to go work for a B2B SaaS company and I, I was running all of the digital. I was their first, first digital marketing employee before they went public. And uh, I go and talk to the CMO, who's my new boss, and I laid out all my strategies. And she was like, okay, all that sounds great. Go ahead and execute it. But just so you know, we started a pilot with LinkedIn ads about two weeks ago. See what you can do. And I saluted and said, yes, ma'am, absolutely. And walked out of her office and was like, oh, I don't want to look stupid, but I've never done anything with LinkedIn ads. I better figure it out. So I jumped into the platform, started working away. And about two weeks later, I had a sales rep who came up to me and said, hey, AJ, we don't know what you're doing over here, but we're fighting over your leads. Keep it up. So I went to go look at those leads in our CRM to see like, Where'd they come from? Which ones are, you know, he's, is he talking about? And sure enough, every single one of them was sourced from LinkedIn. Uh, and it wasn't the only channel I was running. So I, over the course of the next two and a half years, I grew that to become LinkedIn's largest spending account. And because I had great relationships with LinkedIn and I'd, I had such good uh, you know, experience on the platform, I, I told myself there's got to be more companies other than just this one where LinkedIn ads would work well. And so just about eight years ago, I jumped off on my own, started uh, our agencies called b2linked.com. And we're an ad agency where LinkedIn ads is all we do. Uh, we've run many of LinkedIn's largest spending accounts. We've spent over 150 million so far on the platform. And uh, just absolutely, we're one trick ponies. We're proud of it. Uh, LinkedIn ads are all we do. Okay. Yeah, it's an awesome story. I mean, as, uh, as many people say in the marketing space, the riches are in the niches. So it definitely seems like you found your niche there. And, um, and yeah, it's a funny story how you got started, how you didn't know anything, and then you just had to force yourself to, uh, to, you know, to perform well on the job sometimes, you know, like that necessity is like really what can do it for people. Uh, so I think, you know, many people are probably familiar with Google ads and Facebook ads, but definitely not as familiar with um, LinkedIn ads. So I think a really good start here would be to discuss how um, Facebook and Instagram ads and Google ads differ from LinkedIn ads. And in your experience, what are the best use cases for people looking to um, run LinkedIn ads? Perfect. Well, LinkedIn is really close to Facebook. The difference is in the targeting on Facebook, it's very consumer oriented. It's about your interests and engagement on the site. Whereas on LinkedIn, it's all about what's your job title? Where do you work? Where have you worked? What size of company do you represent? What industry are you in? And so much more business focused targeting. The other thing that you'll notice is that LinkedIn is incredibly expensive compared to Facebook. Uh, the average cost per click is like eight to $13 per click uh, on LinkedIn. So because of that, I think there've always been, there have always been higher costs on LinkedIn. And I think it's, it, it's been a deterrent for some people to get in and, and figure it out. But those who are willing to invest, what they notice is as they generate leads, of course, they're going to be two, three times more expensive than your Facebook leads. But instead of your sales team having to throw out 95% of your, your Facebook leads because they're not qualified, on LinkedIn, they're only throwing out 5% because the rest, they were totally qualified. That's exactly how we targeted them. The big difference with Google is when someone is searching on Google, they're looking for something. They have the, the right intent. But what they don't have is the ability to understand, like, who is this person? Do they have, uh, are they the right, uh, are they the right seniority to make this buying decision? Do they have a large enough budget for it? So Google's really good for capturing intent for someone who's looking for something. LinkedIn's really good at getting in front of exactly the right people and then introducing something new and disruptive to them that they may not have considered already. Awesome. Yeah, I've always thought that was the strength of LinkedIn. I mean, it's funny you mentioned like the cost right away. That is like, I think a lot of even the marketers who don't know much about LinkedIn, they do know that it's expensive. And I think yeah. that kind of like prevents people from kind of like digging into it and learning the platform. Um, but yeah, I've always thought that 
the targeting is really what makes LinkedIn special just because, you know, Facebook people set up their accounts, but a lot of times maybe they don't even want to put the information about themselves. So it's harder for marketers to necessarily target them based on like demographics like that. But with LinkedIn, like one, it's like, you know, it helps you professionally, the more information you put and like populate on your profile. And then also just like, you know, people want to do it as like a way in like to, you know, brag in a way for their ego. Um, but there's nothing wrong with that, of course, either. And I've also, also thought the strength of LinkedIn as well is just like the context in which people go. So I'm sure, and I've heard you speak before how, you know, people don't spend anywhere near as much time on LinkedIn as they do like Facebook and like TikTok, for example. But however, when they are on LinkedIn, they're in like the mode for like business educational type content, whereas opposed to Facebook and Instagram and TikTok, they're kind of just, you know, it's kind of like I've, you know, referred to it kind of as like, um, like kind of like cable TV, like junk food kind of in a way. So I think that's just like, it's really important. I think the context, because if you're scrolling through your Facebook feed on like a Thursday night, um, you know, while you're drinking like a glass of wine or something, you probably don't want to get uh, targeted for like a lead magnet about like how to generate leads or something for your like SaaS business. So I think it's funny how you bring up those things. So I think obviously LinkedIn is for B2B professionals, but are there any specific market segments that you see are particularly effective on LinkedIn advertising? You know, it's interesting. Uh, we've noticed that if business targeting is important to you, whether you're B2B or B2C, and you have a high enough lifetime value to make sure that the high cost of LinkedIn, you're still able to recoup those on the back end you know, when you get a return from those ads, um, then really anything can work. So uh, obviously B2B lead gen is, is kind of the, the, the cream. What am I trying to say? Uh, it, it's the majority of what we do, but we also have had some B2C types of, of companies and offers work really well too. And so what we say is because the costs are so high uh, for every click, if you have a lifetime value of your customer that's $15,000 or higher, then LinkedIn ads are a total no-brainer. So you have things like uh, Mercedes, Jaguar, Audi, they all advertise on LinkedIn for their automobiles. And it's obviously because the, the price of the automobile is high enough, they can recoup that investment. Um, there's like financial services, uh, Amex Business is a big advertiser. So those are all, and even recruiting is technically B2C, even though it's it's using their professional info. But yeah, the vast majority is going to be like business to business, uh, larger deal sizes, high lifetime value type of uh, of things. No particular industry. It can be really any industry. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. And I've heard you talk also before how like subscription type software services can also be very good because of like the customer lifetime value. If you get someone on a subscription, it's like a, like a CRM type platform and all, you know, this 500 enterprise type companies can be using it for years. Then it's like a no brainer as well to use LinkedIn ads. So I think a good place to start now that we're kind of like getting deeper into exactly how LinkedIn ads work is what it looks like to set up your first campaign. So probably many people listening to this have run Google ads, have run Facebook ads. So they're familiar with like the basics of like online advertising, but in terms of how LinkedIn differs from those types of platforms, what should people know like specifically different things that they should approach differently when it comes to setting up their first LinkedIn ad campaign? Perfect. Well, what I've noticed is every time I go to launch ads on a new platform, I'm always surprised. I, I'll set aside time on like a Saturday morning and say, okay, I'm going to go and launch YouTube ads. And I, I never end up launching the same day because there's always more to it. I, I forgot I needed access to something over here or forgot to log in there or I need a tool here. Um, so what we did, we actually put together a, a free checklist and it's the same checklist we use when we onboard a new client. It's the eight things that you need set up in order to start advertising. And so anyone who wants to, you can go get it for free at b2linked.com slash checklist. So assume that you have that checklist or, or you're, you're willing to, to take a stab at it yourself. Um, what you'll do is the first thing you do is you either go set up an account or get access to it, and then you'll create your first campaign. Uh, what the campaign is, is it's a representation of who you're targeting in an audience, as well as the ad type that you're going for and the objective. So those are the three things that when you select them, they don't change. And once you have the targeting set up, you also have your, your bidding and budgeting, like how you're paying for the ads within that, that same group as well. But then as soon as you've defined that, then you have, you get to create the ads themselves. So my first recommendation is think about who it is that you actually want to target. Think of them in terms of their job title, their seniority, their size of company, their industry, uh, 
maybe what skills they might have listed on their profile. And then when you go and create your campaign, you'll just be selecting options there to see what's going to be the best fit. But what I want to call your attention to is right below the targeting, there's going to be a little box and it says enable audience expansion. And it's always checked. Uh, your job as a marketer is to go and uncheck that box because essentially what it is, is it's, it's free reign of LinkedIn to be able to charge you the same amount of money. They're charging you a premium for every click. And then they're sticking whoever they want into that audience. Uh, it, it'll end up lowering your lead quality. And then finally, when you get to the bottom, what LinkedIn's going to start you off on in the bidding and budgeting section, they're going to start you with uh, automated delivery or auto bidding or maximum delivery. And what it is, is it's like a really high bidding cost per impression bid. And it's the most expensive way to pay for your LinkedIn traffic 90% of the time. So instead, what you want to do is click the little see more option, like see more options, click on manual bidding, and then choose a maximum cost per click and probably start significantly lower than what LinkedIn recommends because you can always increase it if you're not getting enough traffic. Awesome. Yeah, I remember it was funny. First time we were kind of like speaking, it was, you were like, all right, first, one of the first things you want to do is remove several of the LinkedIn defaults. Yes. And um, I think that's definitely a very good like pro tip for people because when you're new to the platform, they might just think, well, LinkedIn knows best. So let's just keep the default and then expand from there. But I think by following the advice that uh, you just kind of listed, they'll definitely be in a better spot. And, um, and that checklist will definitely be linked in the show notes so people can go ahead and grab it. Um, so I want to talk to you about budgets real quick. But before we do that, I actually have a question regarding, because um, we were talking about like targeting for a second. I'm just curious, how has, um, there's obviously been a lot of news in like the digital marketing space for like the past year, I would say, regarding um, like the iOS 14 um, you know, privacy updates and so many people opting out of the tracking. So primarily in the news, it's been just all about how it's affected Facebook very negatively. But I'm curious, how has it affected LinkedIn ads? Has there been kind of any change? I know LinkedIn also has um, like a, a pixel itself. And, um, you know, the pixel is very va valuable, I find, at LinkedIn, at least, because even if you don't plan on ever running LinkedIn ads, you can still add it to your site. And then in, like, the LinkedIn, you know, ads platform, you can see, like, the types of people who are browsing your site. So it's just, it's just valuable market information, I find. But how has all these, like, privacy updates impacted LinkedIn ads in your experience? I love that you found the free demographics. So few people know about that. And I, I think that's one of the things that's going to be going away as third-party cookies are all phased out across the web. Uh, third-party cookies are what drive that. Like when they visit your website, that's how LinkedIn looks at them to see who they are on LinkedIn and can give you information about you know who's visiting your site. So definitely we're going to lose that or at least take a huge hit. Uh, we're going to take a huge hit probably out of conversion tracking. Uh, LinkedIn has since switched their, their conversion tracking cookie from a third-party cookie to a first party. So hopefully... Our conversions are still going to be coming through, but LinkedIn's kind of preparing for the worst. I see them scrambling and telling people, make sure you're getting all of your conversions into a CRM so that you can actually see them and track them properly. And we are taking a huge hit in retargeting, just like Facebook, just like Google. The big difference to me, though, is that LinkedIn's website retargeting has never been powerful. It's always been expensive. You only have access to people when they're on LinkedIn, which is like not very often. So my recommendation has always been get the right people from LinkedIn to your website and then retarget them with Facebook and Google because their retargeting is amazing. Um, obviously, with iOS 14 and Chrome, you know, dumping third-party cookies, those are all going to take a hit. Uh, but I, I think I would still recommend that strategy because I, I don't know how you feel, but I feel that like Google and Facebook are so good at what they do hopefully they'll find a way around it and still have a good retargeting product. Totally. I, I mean, I'm sure they will eventually find some different solution just because there's just so much money to be made in that solution. So they will eventually find one. Um, but yeah, it's definitely, and it, I know like Google is also as well facing out, like kind of like the tracking as well, similar to kind of like what um, like Apple went ahead and did. So I mean, this is a whole different tangent. I'm sure we could go on, but there's definitely major changes happening in the digital marketing landscape. Um, but let's not go down that route because we could spend forever on that one. So on to budgets now. So obviously a lot of advertisers complain about the high cost of LinkedIn ads. However, I kind of view, I view all marketing more as like an investment and like with any investment, it's not necessarily 
how much something costs, it's how much you can expect um, to get a return on like your initial initial cost or investment. So, and I think LinkedIn in this way makes sense for a lot of companies if like they're gonna have that high customer lifetime value like you were talking about. But in terms of LinkedIn ads and setting budgets, how do you, how much can people expect to spend on a campaign? What's like a good amount uh, to start with if you wanna run your first campaign? And just any other advice you can give people when it comes to setting budgets. Well, Bailey, your mindset is perfect when we're talking about investment, um, because people will come to me and they'll say, hey, I've got $500. Should I be advertising on LinkedIn? And my answer is most often, no, no. It's It would be like, uh, like I want to plan for my retirement. Should I go buy five shares of you know whatever stock that's like $100 a share? Like, yeah, you'll own five, share, you know, five of these shares of stock. Um, they may increase in value 20, 30, 40%. You, you still won't be able to retire. The same kind of thing with LinkedIn. It, it's not about necessarily the amount of money you spend. To me, it's about investing enough in the channel to prove it out, to prove whether it's actually going to be a valuable channel. It's producing high quality leads that will turn into business or it's total garbage. It's too expensive and we need to avoid it in the future. So I would recommend spend enough on it that the results that you get back are statistically significant. You know, with a high amount of accuracy and confidence that yes, this is going to be a good channel or no, it's not. And what we found is if you're measuring down to like the conversion rate, let's say your first test, you're trying offer against offer or ad against ad. It's usually after about $5,000 in ad spend when that test becomes statistically significant. So that would tell me, Hey, if I were telling someone evaluate the channel, I would say, let's, if I don't have $5,000, I want to save that up. And then as soon as I have it, spend 5,000 in a month, get that data, and then decide if I need to make a play for more budget. Uh, or I might say, Ooh, this was great. Uh, I learned that it's not good for me and never have to spend money on it again. Got it. Awesome. Yeah. I think, I think having like giving people a set, you know, budget amount to start with is definitely very helpful. Uh, I'm just curious, do you recommend that people kind of like, you know, regardless of what their budget is and how much they could potentially spend, do you recommend that they start with something low, like $5,000 to get some of those results and then potentially scale up from there? Because I know a lot of people will do that with like Google or Facebook ads, for example. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of starting low, like the lowest amount of risk you possibly can, especially because LinkedIn is inherently a risky platform. It's more expensive for every click. And the advice that LinkedIn gives is expensive advice. Like they want you to spend too much because they like that money in their pockets. Uh, so I like to start low, but certainly if you have budgets that are significantly higher than that, great. You're just going to learn even faster. Um, the thing you want to avoid though, is just throwing so much money at it that your costs are way high. You're bidding too aggressively. And then by the end of the month, you say, oh, results weren't good. And the results weren't good because you were paying too much for your traffic, not because the channel was bad. Got it. Okay. That's very helpful. Um, so now I'm curious, we definitely talked on the, so I think marketing in general can kind of be broken down into audience and offers in like the simplest, most basic form. So we've talked plenty about the audience on LinkedIn and that is really what I think, you know, we both agree on makes it such a valuable platform. Now in terms of offers, you know, what should marketers be thinking about if they're going to be running LinkedIn ads? Like, is there anything that specifically works well. So, you know, whether it be kind of trying to get people, you know, into like a, a sales funnel or trying to get them to, you know, download a lead magnet, are there any particular types of offers that you find work really well with um, LinkedIn ads? Bailey, this is the most important question for the platform. And I'm so glad you asked the offer, like what you're asking someone to do, uh, it, it is make or break to your campaign. And I'll give you an example. You can ask anyone to do anything from your ad. Um, you could ask something very, what I would call low friction, like, Hey, come and read our blog post. Come check out this, this infographic we built. And there's no risk to them. Like they, there's upside if they care about what it is, but if they get two paragraphs into your blog post and think it sucks, they can leave and it doesn't cost them anything. It was just a little bit of their time. Or you could ask them something really high friction, like buy something now, come talk to our sales rep. And these are all things that set off all their anxiety alarm bells. Um, what we find is both of those extremes don't perform very well on LinkedIn. The low friction stuff, like come and read my blog post, it doesn't perform well because you're going to pay eight to $13 a click for every one of those blog post visitors and blog posts don't have a high conversion rate. So you're going to have to tell someone why you have a, a 500 to a thousand dollar cost per conversion. And most people aren't okay with that. 
On the other end of the spectrum, you have cold audiences who don't already know, like, and trust you. And you're asking them to immediately buy or do something anxiety inducing, like talk to someone in sales. And immediately they, they back off and say, nope, not interested. And so it's hard to get volume. The few people who do click are curious, but so you, you pay a lot for them, but they don't end up converting. So crux of the thing is go right in between. Uh, it's a high enough amount of friction because we're asking them to fill out some kind of form, but it's, it's so much value because we're giving them something of value. So think about it in terms of lead magnets or free gated content. And what you want your gated content to be is something that solves a migraine problem, not a headache problem. Uh, this has got to be something that they look at and go, wow, that would be super valuable to me. That helps me solve a major pain point that I have, or it teaches me how to do something that I've been curious about. Um, yes, I'm willing to fill out that form. And so when you have an offer like that, whether it's a, a one-page checklist or a cheat sheet or a, a five-page ebook or a, a 70 page report or a webinar or a guide or a, an online summit, whatever your, the offer is that, that you're putting out there, as long as it has high perceived value, that will be a great lead generator for you. And because someone knew that that was a major pain point, they went out of their way to download it and give you their information. When you go to follow up, they've already given you a clue about what sort of pain points they're facing. So if you can go to them with a very consultative approach of like, Hey, I saw you download this piece of content. You know, are you having the same problem too? We talk to people all day who do would love to talk to you about how we've solved some of those, how we've seen others solve it. And all of a sudden you've broken down that friction in talking to someone. Gotcha. Okay. And I'm just curious, does LinkedIn have um, that, that feature where I know Facebook definitely does where there's like those lead gen forms where you don't even need to necessarily drive people to a landing page, but you can just like click a button and then like a form pops up right in the platform. Uh, does LinkedIn have that? And if it does, do you recommend people use that over perhaps like a traditional landing page? Yes. Uh, LinkedIn does have these, they call them lead generation form ads and they can be attached to any of the in feed ads or any of the in message ads, the ones that go right to your messaging box. Um, about 70% of our clients are using them exclusively. They perform really high. You'll see your conversion rates being like three to four times higher in, in most cases by using them. That being said, I, I don't think there's, um, I don't think there's a substitute for getting someone on your website because when they're on your website, not only do you have analytics, you're capturing UTM parameters, they're receiving a stronger impression about your brand. They get a chance to click around and see the about us page and get to know you better. Um, but you can also retarget them with the other platforms, at least assuming we can. And so I love the idea of getting people to my website that I own. You're going to pay the same amount per click to LinkedIn. Anyway, you might as well own that traffic, but you will have to test and make sure like the forms on my landing page, are they converting high enough that I can justify it? Or would I rather use LinkedIn's lead gen forms, keep that traffic on LinkedIn and have, you know, three to four times the amount of leads and just have them be slightly lower quality. Gotcha. Yeah, I think with a lot of all this digital advertising stuff, it all comes down to just like testing because there's no way you're going to know unless you actually run the ads and see the results and analyze the data. Um, and then speaking of that, so once people have these campaigns up and running, are there any kind of like key metrics or KPIs you recommend people track? Obviously, this depends a lot on like the goals of the campaign and um, kind of like the objectives, but just in terms of like CPC, uh, CPA, like ROAS or turn on ad spend, are there any kind of like benchmarks people should have in mind for these campaigns to know whether or not they're succeeding? Yeah, I love this question. I basically follow the whole process of the visitor from seeing an impression of the ad all the way until they become a customer. And depending on how much volume I have, because obviously two days into it to advertising, when you've only spent $50, you're not going to want to look at your cost per lead and say, yeah, this is working great or you know, whatever. Uh, at $50 in, you won't know what your actual conversion rate is yet. You'll need quite a few more of them to support it. So with very little data, I would say in your first thousand dollars spent, what I'm paying attention to is click through rate. The in feed ads are my favorite place to start. And I know the average click through rate on those is about 0.44%. So if I launch those ads and in the first day and a half, uh, first day, two days, even if I see that I have a click-through rate that's lower than that, I assume I did something wrong. I didn't get the message right, and I'm going to pause and start again. 
But if, if you're higher than that, then you've kind of passed that first hurdle. The next hurdle, and when you're doing that, you should expect costs in the like $8 to $13 range. Uh, you should really only be paying significantly higher than that if you're going after a really competitive audience like the CEOs of the Fortune 500, uh, or if you're spending like hundreds of thousands a month in budget, you actually do have to bid really aggressively to spend that much. So that's kind of first set of KPIs. Then once you've spent, let's say, uh, three, four, five thousand dollars, that should be enough to watch what your conversion rate is and my cost per conversion. And then once you've generated enough of those, then you're measuring, uh, you know, let's say you're ten thousand dollars in, you're probably measuring my cost per MQL or my cost per, per SQL. Um, if you're in B2B and you're tracking these kinds of stages, uh, once you've spent, you know, 30, 50, a hundred thousand dollars, maybe you're tracking all the way to cost per propo cost per proposal or cost per closed deal. So I think it just depends on what stage you are. If you're early, concentrate on the metrics that are a little higher in the process. Uh, if you've spent a lot and you're testing down deep, then you actually can pay attention to things like ROAS and return on investment. Yeah. So I think overall, we've definitely covered a lot when it comes to LinkedIn ads. I definitely think this has been like a you know a quick like crash course on all things LinkedIn. But when it comes to, so I believe like the power, what really makes LinkedIn interesting to me, you know, I'm not running any ads on LinkedIn, although I do have some experience for past clients. But what really makes LinkedIn interesting to me is like the organic side of it, because the amount of reach you can get on LinkedIn is just insane. For example, yes. like I recently relaunched my company website. And so I just like made like a short little post, like, Hey, after a few months of working on it, it's finally done this website, check it out. And, um, and I also included like the, the link in like the post, which I know some people will say don't do because then like LinkedIn will see that like, it's like a link. So it's going to take people off the platform, which you're not going to want to promote too much. Although at the same time, that makes sense. But at the same time, I'm like, their algorithm is definitely smart enough to see that you just left a comment to the link as well. So I don't True. know how much of a big deal it might necessarily be. Um, but yeah, I do think like the organic reach, but for example, that, that post, reached almost like a thousand people where, um, as on Facebook, that would have cost you, you know, a lot of money to reach a hundred people potentially. So I'm just curious, is there any way uh, or any strategies or any way companies should, you know, potentially think about, um, leveraging both the organic side of LinkedIn along with like the paid, the paid ad side? Yeah, Bailey, I think you nailed it on the organic reach being insane. What we see is that on LinkedIn, you know, a hundred percent of us need like posts in our newsfeed, but only 5% of people are willing to post. And I'm assuming that means people are like afraid, daunted maybe by the platform, like, oh, I don't want to say the wrong thing and screw up future career prospects or something. But whatever it is, LinkedIn's looking at, ooh, only 5% are creators. We're going to have to put stuff in people's newsfeeds. So what they do is anytime that, that you hit like, comment, or share on a post, one of those social actions, especially comment, that's the most powerful one, then LinkedIn goes, ooh, there's something exciting happening here, and they'll share that post with a portion of your network. So when you share something that actually gets people to engage, especially getting them commenting, you'll see your posts will go viral. You'll get um, interactions from your network, and then your network's network, and then your network's network's network. So super powerful, I think very, very underestimated right now, but more and more people are coming to spend more time on LinkedIn because they appreciate that that reach. So I'm, I'm huge on it. Um, but in terms of how the organic reach and your advertising can work together, what we find is your advertising has to be based off of a company page. And you may have noticed if you post something from your company page and you post the same thing from your personal profile, you'll probably get 10 times the engagement personally. And I think that's because when, uh, when we're on LinkedIn or I guess really anywhere, we like to do business and communicate with people because we know that they're going to appreciate that. We know they're going to see it. But if we comment on a company or we share so something from a company, we have no idea if, if anyone even cares. It's just, you know, a faceless organization. And because we know that comments and interactions are the most powerful thing for virality, I think that tells us why company pages don't go viral nearly as often. So what I find is the combination of the two, organic and paid, if you are showing ads to exactly the right people, you're going to be getting leads from the leads that are coming in are going to be really high quality because you defined who they were in your targeting. Organically though, you don't really get to do targeting. 
And so when you put something out and you start to get leads or interactions or contacts, um, you don't know who they are, what they represent, but you're getting fans, you're getting people to get to know you and you're growing a brand. So I see them working very well together. Of course, you hope that there's crossover and you hope that the people that you're advertising to start following your company page. So they start seeing your stuff organically more often for free. But, um, but yeah, there, there's not very much crossover between the two, but I highly recommend combining them any way that you can. Okay, cool. Yeah, and it's very funny how like the company pages don't get near the amount of organic reach as like the personal pages. Uh, so yeah, it's definitely very interesting. Um, but I'm curious, how do you kind of like see like the future of this kind of playing out? Because obviously many people may not know this, but LinkedIn's actually owned by Microsoft and they bought them like a few years ago. So I think obviously LinkedIn is not going anywhere with a company like Microsoft behind it. But, you know, the LinkedIn organic reach has been well known for like, I think like, because I was watching a, like a video on this and it was from 2019. And the person was saying LinkedIn is like super hot right now for landing clients and because of the organic reach. And here we are in uh, like early 2022. And it's still super hot for that organic reach. And it definitely does go back to what you were saying, just like simple supply and demand. And I had um, Matthew Hunt on the podcast recently. He talked all about organic LinkedIn marketing. And he was saying the same thing, how only 5% of the people are producing content. So they just are kind of forced in a way. Um, so do you, do you see this like changing at all? Do you think it's still, obviously it's always going to be helpful for, you know, B2B marketing, marketing professionals, but do you see, you know, the organic reach kind of declining perhaps over time? Because, you know, I'm always a bit, you know, I had a friend, we were talking about like his LinkedIn ads, his LinkedIn strategy. He was doing a lot of like, um, you know, just kind of like the um, message you will say. And essentially his thought process was because of the organic reach on LinkedIn and how effective it is um, and how many impressions you can get on a post. His thought process was once I've connected with people, if I keep producing content on LinkedIn, then it's almost like being in their email inbox in a way, because you're just constantly able to exactly. show up when people log in. Which, which was at the current organic, uh, you know, impression rates, I would definitely agree. However, at the same time, I'd rather have that email address as opposed to kind of like building um, my platform, my, um, you know, whole marketing strategy on, you know, what I would kind of call like rented, rented property with, you know, the algorithm could change any day. And we've seen that definitely in the past on Facebook, um, for example. So I'm just curious, what do you, how do you kind of like see it like kind of playing out long term? Because I just get a little wary, I suppose, when I've seen that it's been like this for a while and it's been really good for a while, but I always wonder how much longer can that continue? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think virality will always be there as long as not very many people are posting. And it was uh, three years ago, maybe it was four years ago, the stat was only 3% of people created like posted content. And now we're up to five. Um, so as more and more people are posting, that's more and more uh, creators. So there's less room for everyone to go viral. I've already seen this. You know, back in 2019, I had several posts that got between 50 and 90 thousand views on them, which is crazy. Now most of everything wow, that I post is somewhere too. between. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. And we got some great leads. We got great business out of it. I mean, it's awesome. Now I would say the majority of our posts are getting somewhere between 10 and 20 thousand views. So not terrible by any means, but it's, it's certainly less than what it was. So I, I think the more people who realize that that viral reach is here and they come and be creators, it'll kind of thin out results for everyone. But we also have this ability for more people to come and spend more time on LinkedIn, opening up additional inventory for everyone. And that would help viral reach go even higher. So I know LinkedIn's kind of seen as the boring business platform, but the more people come and spend time and realize there's a lot of value and good conversations to be had, uh, it actually helps all of us. Got it. Okay. Good to know. Well, AJ, this has been a really wonderful conversation. I think just, um, you know, a total crash course on LinkedIn ads. I think anyone who listens to this is going to have a wealth of knowledge and have plenty to research as well if they're interested in setting up a LinkedIn ads campaign. So as we wrap up here, um, why don't you tell uh, the audience um, how they can like stay in touch with you and learn more about your company um, if they're interested? Awesome. Well, if you want to come follow me or connect with me on LinkedIn, uh, just search for AJ Wilcox. I'm pretty sure I'm the only one or one of the few. And if you send me a, a connection request with that custom message that says that you heard me on Bailey's show, then that's perfect. I'll make sure I accept and we can be connected. Uh, or you can follow and just see all the content that I'm putting out. Uh, if you're interested in possibly exploring doing LinkedIn ads with us, you can just go to our website, b2linked.com and fill out the form on any of those pages. And we'd love to help you explore. 
Okay, awesome. Yeah, I'll definitely link all those uh, resources in the show notes so people can just click and get right to them. But AJ, thank you for taking the time to have this conversation with me. I think it was uh, super, it was just a great conversation overall. So thanks again and uh, looking forward to uh, staying in touch with you. Awesome, Bailey. Have me back anytime. All right. Sounds good. Take it easy.